Woo, we're back with another episode of Leaders Create Leaders. Welcome back live. Welcome back podcast. Um, I appreciate you guys for joining me uh, every single day here. Uh, and we have a really amazing, amazing guest. But before he jumps on, I just want to welcome everybody coming on. What's going on, Joey? What's popping? What's popping? What's up, Ryan? Uh, what's going on, everybody? Do me a favor real quick. I love seeing it's a global community. Drop a comment your first name and where you're from. I love seeing how global everyone is from all over the world. Shout out to all my day one community tribe members of Leaders Create Leaders. Uh, So comment where you're coming in from. What's up, Tyler? What's popping? What's popping? What's good, everybody? Got Queens in the building. I see you. You got Leo from Miami. Shout out to Leo. Shout out to Lisa from New York City. Shout out to Tyler from South Florida. What's going on, Tyler? Always good to see you. Ricky from Van City. We got Jason from Florida. We got uh, you know, Hayden from Charlotte. We have, let's see, Collins up in here. We have some, uh, let's see, we got Mahad from Tanzania. I love it, guys. We have this amazing global community. My man John Henry's up in here. I'm so excited, guys. Uh, I'm going to be bringing him on, and I want you to give a really powerful welcome to John. He is a servant leader. I mean, this guy has served the community in the entrepreneurial community for as long as I can remember for me coming into the scene over the last five years. I have so much reverence for this man, for what he has done for our community in the entrepreneur, entrepreneur sense, for just also the minority community, the Latin community, African-American community. He has built a venture capital fund, co-founded it, raised over $40 million to help make diverse investments, over 17 investments. He's now a real estate developer creating generational wealth for his family. And he's just, uh, he's unbelievable. I mean, we're talking Forbes 30 under 30, Inc. 30 under 30. What's going on, Mick? Good to see you in here. So Tribe, I appreciate you guys all taking some time. I think this is going to be a really powerful live with John. I'm going to bring him on. As you guys know, I always like you to just drop an emoji to welcome John. So drop an emoji, a powerful emoji, whether it's a fire emoji, you know, money bag, the flex. Just give him an emoji when he comes on here to give him a warm welcome. And let's bring him on now. There we go. Prepare your questions. My man, yes. <laughs> Yo, bro. What's up, G? What's good, bro? Oh, man, it's so good to see you. My, you doing, man? my, my Dominican brother over there. <laughs> I see you, man, looking more Dominican than ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, how's oh. that? are you in L.A. right now? I'm in Sedona, Arizona. Oh, dope, dope. Yeah. How's that? You always oh, in great places, man. <laughs> oh, thanks, bro. Listen, you know me. I got it. Just, it's part of me. I can't stay still. I got to keep it moving. It keeps my creative juices flowing. And, yep. and it helps me to, to, with this entrepreneurial lifestyle, man, those ups and those downs, yep. being able to be close to the land and, and exploring and the nature it really always, man, it just brings me so many lessons and, and boost my, you know, just what I need from an inspirational standpoint to keep going no matter what, you know? Mm, I feel that, man. I feel that. I love it, bro. Thank you for the very warm welcome. And uh, I'm, yeah. I'm pumped, man. It's actually been a little while since we caught up, so I'm looking forward to it. Bro. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, man, it's been, I, bro, I, I love just seeing your journey. Even when you, like, because you're so real and so authentic that like even when you pull back, it's like you just know that you're hustling and making real moves. <laughs> and there's yeah. a lot of, you know, the instapreneurs and people out here that, that have the followers and have the fame and all those things. But there's, there's few that really are as raw as you are that really and provide <laughs> real, real value, man. Like you just, you're, you just let everybody in, man. So I appreciate all the work that you've done I, and honor to, to have you on today, man. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pin a comment, John, real quick. Yep. Um, and in the meantime, bro, why don't you guys, if you haven't seen John's full story, you got to go to Leaders Create Leaders and watch the episode. We did a really powerful episode together. But John, I want to get right to it, bro, because you have, uh, it seems like you have learned a lot over the last year. So mm. I want you to just talk a little bit about right now, what has shifted for you during this 
you know, this economic recession during this health crisis with COVID, like what have you learned during this time right now? Man, wow. That's a great, it's a great and powerful way to start. Um, and I think that the, what I've learned is that I've learned over mm -hmm. the last decade. Um, and I think, you know, when we're caught up in our process and, you know, day in, day out, sometimes it's lost on you just how much you're actually soaking in. And, you know, we place so myself included so much pressure on ourselves to kill it, to crush it, you know, to raise money, to do this, to do that. And um, it's not until, at least for me, at, at a time like this, when you're forced to take a seat and really observe. And <clears throat> I've, you know, I can say to myself that I feel like I've learned a good amount over the last decade. And, you know, that mm -hmm. seems like an obvious statement, but like, man, sometimes it takes a, you know, you need the pause to hear the music, right? Mm -hmm. So like Miles Davis would always say that the music is in the silence. So for, for the musicians that play really fast and they just don't give you any space, it's impressive, but Miles Davis would play a few notes and pause like I did there, right? And then a few more notes. And so, you know, this is a pause right now. This is a pause and it's a very weird kind of pause because for the one of the only times I can think of the whole, it's a global pause, global. I mean, you know, it'd be one thing if it were our country or another country, you know, what, but it's like everyone's in lockstep. And so it's just been really, um, you know, my family was affected by COVID. My mom and, and father were ho both hospitalized. Actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, it sucked, man. It was, you know, and it happened quite early in the COVID cycle. They've gotten much better, thankfully. Um, and, you know, life resumes as, as normal. But, you know, I know that not everyone was fortunate enough to, you know, they didn't go through it like that. You know, there were different outcomes. So anyway, I'm coming out of, you know, I'm, I'm in, in the thick of it now. And um, just feeling really grateful to have learned. I mean, I've learned a lot about business, but here's one thing, man. Like, you're going to learn whatever you spend your time in, right? Like, I saw Mick in here, you know, Mick is yeah. a high-profile DJ. You know, if, you know, he's going to say, if you've asked him, if you ask him, like, what, what have you learned over the last decade, you know, DJ is going to be at the top of the list because that's what he does every day. And so, like, it's just giving me that piece that like, hey, whatever you do day in, day out, you're going to get better at. And, yeah. some, and that relieves some anxiety for me about the, the process because you just do it day in, day out, you're going to get better. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say is um, this time allows you to reflect on how um, your decision making was over the past few years. And it's funny because I found my... Um, I found my life and economic situation mirror my temperament. I'm very aggressive. Wow. I move very quickly. You know, I'm overly optimistic, you know, and like, this is how I roll. Like, I'm just going to be that way forever. But then now that, you know, the overstimulus in the market isn't there to disguise, you know, um, missteps, it's clear to me, you know, where I went wrong and where I went right. So in this time when it's like a low tide, right? When the water pulls back, you'll see everything that's on the shore. So um, it's just been fascinating, man. Been really fascinating to just like learn a little bit more about myself, about how I've conducted my businesses um, and, you know, just good reflection time for on a go forward. Thank you for sharing, brother. Um, what I'm hearing is like, it's real wisdom. Uh, just just the fact of even just talking about guys like what he's mentioning in the sense of like po like having poise you know really like slowing down and this has created this like pause around the entire globe and it's such a beautiful time of reflection and like sitting and really just like honing in on where you want to focus um and like wherever it is that you you're passionate about focusing if you just really hone in on that and spend you know every day focusing in on what that skill is what that niche is every day you will progress um, but also like it just sounds to me like it's pure wisdom what i love man is like you know you know i've been really going all in on spirituality over the last three years i mean i grew up obviously religious but there was a difference with like being growing up being religious yep. versus like my spirituality and 
it's, it, I feel like it's all prepped me for this COVID moment where like even me, I started to like analyze what are those shadows? Because they're like, like you, John, I think one of the things that me and you mirror for each other is like we're both these promoter types. Mm -hmm. And with promoter types, <laughs> it's what I realized, bro, because this just happened to me. And I had an incident that happened within my business where I was like, okay, I had to self-reflect with myself and say to myself, like, all right, how do I take radical responsibility right now and ownership for what I've done and what my mistakes are and where can I learn from this and grow? And that's what mm -hmm. great leaders have the poise and the mm -hmm. wisdom and the experience to do. And mm -hmm. this happened with me recently with one of my clients and they sent me a letter and I was like, all right. And what I realized was like through reading this letter about missing their expectations in one area, I was like, okay, what I realized is like there's these archetypes and I'm a promoter. And what happens with promoters is like, like you, we're these big visionaries. We have charisma. Like we can, yeah. we can sell some shit. We can sell a vision. You know, we're yeah, great yeah, yeah, at yeah. like leading teams and bringing people together and inspiring others and all these great things, right? But then there's also this other side where probably what I heard from you saying was like, we can overly get excited sometimes yeah. and be quick starts and not think about, okay, really did I think this through for the next, not just 10 minutes, but 10 months or 10 years. Exactly. And um, knowing exactly. how to like really slow down those decisions on when to bring up those visions or when to make those moves. Exactly. So it sounds like, you know, you had a yep. similar situation that to learn a lot of that, man, it's, and it's cool. Cause like that just for me shows like we're growing, bro. We're growing. Yep. Yeah. And, and man, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that's such a nuance that people don't often discuss. Like, around these archetypes like you know it's so interesting in the social media world you know and obviously you do a lot of work with folks helping them build their personal brand well at some point in your journey of building your brand especially when it's a personal brand um you know you become a caricature of yourself in a way where you know you're you but you know you're Gerard Adams, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you're Gerard, I'm John Henry, you know, Gary's Gary V, you know, and so like we build these personas and, you know, it takes it for me, it's taking careful inquiry into like, okay, where does the, you know, where does the caricature end and I begin or vice versa? And, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply fascinating kind of like, white space that I think is specific and particular to like our generation and specifically like people who do what we do. Yeah. So I'm glad we're both taking the time to like stop and think that through because, yeah. you know, that's where the growth comes from, I think. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's like that identity and it's, and it's just, and it's important because when we get, we get, you know, this all just happened. Like people forget, you know, personal brands, it's been around forever, right? Steve Jobs, Jesus Christ, biggest personal brand ever. Yeah. But like the, the, acceleration because of social media over these last 10 years when YouTube came into existence, when the Instagram came into existence, it almost was like we rushed to brand and document and a lot of our own as millennials, we're still discovering who the fuck we even are, yeah. right? Like we're still figuring out who we are, what matters to us, you know, yep. what, where we want, right? You've shifted like me, we were startup entrepreneurs. I mean, for fucking over 10 years, I was building tech startups and all that stuff. And it's like, <laughs> boom, you're realizing, damn, yo, I put a lot of work there. But if I just put a little bit more focus on creating yeah. some real assets and going from an operator to an owner. Yep. Exactly. Man, what would the next 10 years look like for me mm. and the legacy that I live? Good catch. Right? That's exactly that so, shift that occurred. Yep. So then all of a sudden it's like, oh, snap, I just built this persona that's all startup entrepreneur based. Yes, I'm still that guy. Yes, that's a part of me, but that's not who I am. I'm this, you know, multidimensional human being that's growing and is going to continue to like learn new skills and try new things. And, and, um, and I've been seeing you do that, bro. And I honor you, man. It's Thank really, you, man. really powerful, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, it, it took, you know, it's interesting because I was already in business for years. You know, at, at first I thought being in business was kind of like the first, you know, holy grail, so to speak. Um, but then you realize, you know, to your point, you know, I discovered the power of assets. And the reason I just care so much about it, you know, like, I think people prescribe this very black and white shrewdness to business, let's say. Um, but I don't know, for me, man, like, obviously, you and I both see it as a vehicle for change. And going through my experience with my first and second business, where I built them up both, 
And then I realized like, man, unless I'm there running the business, look, unless you take it to a liquidity event and sell the business, then you get a little bit of cash, which I was fortunate to do once. But then, then on my second go around, you know, it was a non for profit. And I realized like there was going to be no liquidity event. And you know, you went through something similar with founders. Yep. Yeah. And so like, I just started thinking like, damn, every time like I start to yeah, think, I gotta like build all the way to the end. It's like you start mapping that out, and you're like, "All right, well, there's gotta be, you know, yeah. what's up, Trav? Trav Weeks is in here, Driven Society. Um, there's gotta be a way that you can work this out." And then you start looking historically to some communities that, like, I admire very much, like the Jewish community. Um, yeah. You know, Italians went through this in the early 19th century. Um, you know, Syrians, um, you know, the certain communities have done well about banding the family together, the village together, and creating a foundation of assets that stands the whole community up. Right. And, you know, that's kind of like the way that I've been on over the last few years. And I'm just scratching the surface. But man, I've been I've really been in the trenches, man. <laughs> I've really been in there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and what's cool is like, you have, I think when we talk leadership, right, like great leadership comes from character. And character is literally only built through grit, right? It doesn't come when things are easy. It comes when things are tough. And the thing that I, you know, always admire about you is like, you love the grit because you're used to it, right? It's, yeah. it's easy when you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you have, and you grow up when you have everything kind of handed to you. God bless them. I want my right. kids to grow up and have wealth. Same. But there's a unique thing that's like this underdog effect that most people don't realize until later in their life where like you have the natural character and resilience in you. It's almost like the tough skin that you've built over time to have that grit for you to get back into the weeds, learning that, okay, this is what these communi communities have done over time to create real wealth and then yep. get in the trenches. Say to yourself, all right, I got to learn this new skill. I got to learn this yep. new industry. And if I'm going to learn, I'm going to go and I'm going to freaking go and start to freaking ply that wood and dig yep. those holes and learn yep. from the ground up and not look for the easy way out, not look for the easy way to do it, but like go and get in the weeds and you're doing that, bro. And talk to me a little bit about what that experience has been like for you, me being a Latino as well. And, you know, I've been looking at this as one of the greatest opportunities in American and really human history to history, create wealth. Yeah. Yep. to come out of this, right? I made a lot of wealth after the last re economic recession, but this COVID one, I feel is going to really be one of the biggest and what a great opportunity in the beginning of a new decade. And for the Latin community, especially the minority community, what would you say to them? And what have you learned most recently in stepping into this mm. new career path to yeah. create wealth? No, I think it's a great question. And, you know, to your point about like, you know, I do have a natural like love for, you know, doing like work that doesn't scale, just like grit work. And I actually came to a head, man, because, um, you know, over the last number of years, I, you know, started and built Harlem Capital and we raised, you know, so much money, so much more money than we thought that we would. Um, and, you know, it was historic for diverse diversity focused funds. But then I found myself at a crossroads where like I always you know, this is just like a moment of vulnerability, right? But I always felt like an outsider in that world because most of the people in that world, even just race aside, like even if you take the small uh, sector of, of color investors, you know, like a lot of them come from either affluent backgrounds and or if not that, then they broke in usually through education, higher education, Harvard, Yale. And so there's like a lot of like, old world type of, you know, way to roll, you know, you're very, it's very buttoned up, you're gonna have the tie, you know, you don't curse, you know, you certainly don't promote like what we do is like a sin in the finance world. And, you know, and so I found myself repeatedly feeling very much like an outsider. And so I, I because I love the dirt, I love the grind. And like, that's just where I feel most at home. And so I, I had this moment where I had to realize like, I came to a fork in the road. I could no longer, I was playing both sides and Harlem Capital grew to such a point where we were infecting so many people, raise real money from real endowments. We raised money from the state of Michigan. Like wow. we're talking state endowments, pensions, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Like these are real, real LPs that were writing uh, mid figure million dollar checks um, at a time. And so there just came a time when 
I had to decide if I was going to be that or not. And wow, wow, like a the, real decision that you had to make at one point. It was a fork in the road. Like, am I going to say, you know what, I can put the social media stuff to the side. Let me button up. Let me play my part, do what I got to do. And by the way, there is almost no path that um, has as high a probability of becoming wealthy, like being a fund manager, because you collect fees and then you generate profits from the money. And so, you know, I was seeing a very clear path to getting pretty rich right like i want i want like 50 to 100 maybe 250 m's yeah and i'm seeing a path for that like logically but then there was also the like intuitive side oh as well oh my gosh and that killed me that i was every day i was like fuck like i spent half a decade building this and now like i love that i have the experience of having built it and i know how to do it and i could probably do it again with the right team but like it just wasn't where my path was like i don't know mm. why even though that ship was up and running i was still you know in the fucking buildings like like you know fucking jackhammering a courtyard like you know and and so ultimately i made the very scary decision of like let me follow what i think feels right even though mathematically and on paper it might be the wrong decision so that's something that i wrestled very much with man sometimes because I, I gave up what could have been what, what was likely going to be you know you know M's on M's on M's. You know, I still have my equity in the first fund, but you really make the money from subsequent funds, fund two, fund three, fund four. Um, so yeah, man. So I just, I wanted to preface that because I, I feel like that's, you know, it's an honest moment for people watching <clears throat> whom, you know, they might have a path in front of them where they know they're going to make more money, but, you know, they might just be drawn to something that, you know, on paper just don't make any damn sense, but like they just fucking love to do it. And so I, I, said to myself, you know what, if I'm going to stack 50, 100, 250 M's, you know, I don't, I'm not going to tolerate any censorship on Twitter. You know, I'm not going to have to wear a tie if I don't want, like, it's going to be being exactly like how I want to roll. And this is how I want to roll, you know, so I'm just doing it now. Um, so yeah, I love it. So Daryl says here, you know, God is setting you up for something bigger, bro. And what's interesting about that statement is like, I really believe that, right? Like you ever see that meme? It's like, God, it's like, nah, bigger. And it's like, right, right. mathematics, again, you're like, here, like, damn, it's like right there. This is, you know, but and this is another thing that I'm going to bring up towards, towards this statement and, and what he just said is like, I'm reading, <laughs> I'm reading a book right now, John, it's called The Road to Character. And in the book, it talks about a lot of different stories. And one of the stories that I had just read about um, over the last day was a story of, you ever hear of the story of Viktor Frankl, similar to Anne Frank, yes. who's a Holocaust survivor. Yes. And he talks about what he went through during that Holocaust and how he's laying railroad tracks. And he's like, this is crazy. Like, I never thought this is what my life was going to be. But he had this internal thing where although all this terrible evil was ha happening around him, he said to himself, in life, sometimes life has this bigger plan for you that you don't even necessarily <clears throat> see or understand. But, like, life needs you to play a specific role. Like, you're here for maybe 100 150 years, depending on what happens with, with who knows what, right? right Let's just right. say 100 years if we're lucky. You know, in the scheme of like a billions of years of this world of Earth and what's happening with humans, you played your part, right? Like, although it may not make logically, like you played an extremely vital, memorable, being a memorable leader, legacy, talk legacy, legendary part in doing what you, that what you did with Harlem Capital and that venture fund that's going to make what you wanted, which is going to make so much impact, impact that you might not even probably be able to totally quantify. And that's what your part was, what life, what God had for you there. But now there's another part. And bro, what's really beautiful and powerful is that you had the, the, the courage and the experience to listen to that instinct, listen to that intuition and, and do the hard thing, the uncomfortable, the uncertain thing of like going back to the jackhammer and going back and doing what you, you know, what you love. So, bro, I just, I commend you on that. And you, uh, it's not easy to do that. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, it was tough, man. Um, but, you know, the, the plus side is like, you know, I get to, this is a property that, you know, we, you know, bought, I bought, oh, bro, when we bought this, like this, thing was just a gaping hole there's nothing wow. here you know like this morning i repotted all these flowers with my mom wow which is so special you know there's some there's families living in here 
And, um, you know, it, the place became not, it's not even mine anymore in a way, you know, it is, <laughs> like, cat table, but like, it just becomes part of know, the fa other families now. Yeah. It just be and like, it gets to, it becomes where someone else hosts memories. And so, yeah, I guess to your point around, like, this is a, um, this is a, a great time to build wealth. I, I agree, man. I agree. And I'll just preface with this. It's hard to look at this as a like a purely economic play because there's so much suffering. So, um, you know, first and foremost, just very mindful, especially because like I, I, you know, I'd been affected, so I know it's a real thing. And hundred thousand gone, and I'm looking at the leadership. I don't mean to make it political, but just yep, like, yep, yep. I don't see the type of leadership that makes me feel dignified and like you know, whatever. I agree. So, I'm just feeling like, okay, man, all right, you know, let's like i'm feeling like really energized to mobilize man like the work that you and i do g right now is extra important extra yeah, and and you know there's gonna be a lot of you know there's gonna be a lot of ty lopez it, i don't mean to write yeah. on time there's gonna be a lot of guys <laughs> like that springing up and trying to teach courses on real estate and stuff like that i don't care what it takes you know i really want people to mobilize and you know develop because look at the end of the day there's a, a number of frontiers where you can make impact, but um, there's also like, there's a hierarchy of those like political, I've realized matters a lot because policy, when you change policy. Mm. Like, oh know, yeah. So I'm right. just becoming more sensitive to policy being a frontier where there's change, you can affect change. But then there's also economic change, right? Because when you yeah. have a strong economic base, and by the way, it's not enough for one person to get rich. Like you need, a community of people to develop, you know, to be upwardly mobile and lift their median net worth. Why? Because then they have real representation in their communities. And I yeah. realized, right, because of where the places where I buy, that the more affluent neighborhoods, pay attention, they have more stop signs on the, on the roads. They have more stop signs. I realized that I was like, huh, why? Because they're concerned about speeding and their kids getting hit. So what do they do? They rally. In, in local community and they put stop signs, you know, their roads are paved, you know, and like wow. there, there's, there's less uh, on average, there's eight times less liquor stores and, you know, that in more affluent neighborhoods than poor neighborhoods. And so all that stuff even just like these design. Wow. That's so interesting because I remember when we were doing the social impact work um, for a uh, little over two years in Newark, building out the community there, um, and Norfolk and Sussex, shout out to everybody from Jersey. You know, one of the things that we were doing, we were activating in the community. We were, built, we were planting trees. We were, you know, going and serving students. But I remember at one point we did, we were going and just cleaning up garbage from the street. And I couldn't believe that there were no garbage cans on the streets. There was like no garbage cans. So I'm like, how do we expect our community to help keep this clean when the kids can't even, there isn't even a garbage can anywhere so right. I tried to rally up. I went to the mayor. I went to the community and everything. But we didn't have enough power. And what happened was, it was like, oh, you know, in order to, you can put the garbage cans, we can raise the money. I was like, I'll pay for the garbage cans on all the streets, personally. Right. Like, yeah, but then you have to have the garbage trucks to reroute <laughs> to pick up the garbage. And there was so much bureaucracy. And, and I was like, man, I can't believe this is so difficult just to add garbage cans to help this community keep the streets clean. So what mm. you're saying, man, I'm like, wow, it all comes together for me. It's really powerful yeah. to talk no, about that's that. A, so. That's a very powerful point because it all, there's a dom, you know, there's domino effects and, and who's going to want to, you know, it's, it's easier to, you'll want to keep your community clean if you find it clean, A, but then B, if there's, you know, <laughs> ways to keep it clean, like you're saying with the garbage can. So all these things all tie in and then it just lowers, someone's talking about vibration. It just lowers the, the median vibration. And so right. now we're getting into societal and systemic things. And, you know, I haven't began to, uh, you know, uncover the depths of all that. But what I do know is that, you know, folks like you and I, we're in position to at least start affecting change. And so, you know, now to take it all the way into, okay, well, what's this economic opportunity? Well, you know, who knows, you know, how industries are going to be affected. Um, but what I do know is that, you know, income generating, income generating real estate stands the test of time. And, um, right, you know, there's going to be a lot of investors that were overzealous in the amount of money that they paid for property. Um, and they're going to be hurt coming out of this. And so, you know, 
<clears throat> it's just it's time to get in position, which means that you have to yes. have the basics in place in order for you to, to be able to acquire. So, um, yeah, we can get into some of the. I would like to. Degree. Yeah. 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 I would um, love to do that. Let's 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 do some education here. Let's go into a little bit of the nitty gritty. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, I'm still a student of the game. I'm looking to you know, be in position, um, even just in places like where I'm at now in Sedona, I went to some different houses. I'm getting a feel for the market Great. primarily because now global travel is going down. People are going to be looking for places like this that I feel are these areas where they can drive to with their families. Um, yep. they're closer to nature. So like, talk to me a little bit, like just, I'm, I'm going to let you kind of run here. What are some of the basics that you should look for? to start getting into position, regardless of where you're at on that hierarchy of, of, you know, yep. of wealth in your life. Yep. I love it. Um, so a couple of things that I've learned here. <clears throat> One, you should follow the deal. You shouldn't buy necessarily based on a budget. You should buy based on the deal. And I think that that confuses folks at first because your natural inclination will be, okay, well, I'm going to buy what I can, you know, afford with the cash that I have on hand now. But then, you know, if you're like me, when you started, you know, you didn't have much cash on hand. So then that leads you to kind of smaller deals, which inherently have less value because anything four units or less is considered residential. And the way that the reason that's important is because the way you value residential real estate is based on um, what other houses in the neighborhood sold for. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, OK, you bought a house. Well, it depends. Susie's house on the block and Joe's house on the block, the value of their home kind of affects your home, right? And so that's what happened with the housing crisis where like everyone's uh, asset is tied to one another. So when the value goes down, kind of they all come down when the median value comes down. The reason I really like multifamily apartments and <laughs> because anything five plus units is considered commercial, meaning it's being used for commercial gain, which means Anyone buying a 12 plex, a 20 plex is not buying in it to live in it like a house. They're buying it because of the income that it generates. And now here's a really important thing. The valuation method, the way you value income properties is based on the net operating income. In other words, how much cash flow it produces. And I don't know about you guys, but we can't control the housing market. You can't control right. what Susie's house down the block sells. And by the way, there's a lot of people that make good money doing that because they they know they have a good eye for aesthetics and they know how to make a home, you know, ideal for like a Susie, you know, like a first time home buyer. From you know? family. Yeah. Correct. And th that's not really my skill set. Where where I the reason I like commercial is because if the valuation is gonna be based on the income, then that's a figure that I have completely within my control. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that once I realized like, okay, I'm going to go commercial. Then next step, I found it, you know, I found a property. I went on loopnets.com and you can look for deals. And the next thing you'll be confronted with is you're not going to know what's a good deal. What's a bad deal. You know, people will ask me all the time, well, what's, you know, what's a good deal. What's, well, until you crunch a hundred deals, you can go and wow. download a deal analysis template, which is what I did when I was teaching myself this stuff. And I would take the first deal that I found and pop in the numbers. This is the purchase price. This is the cash flow that the listing says. And then it would shoot a return out. But if you only have one data point, it's not enough for you to learn, right? It's like Facebook, the algorithm gets smarter with more volume. Right. And so you, your mind is a model and your model gets smarter with more data. So I crunched the next deal and the next deal. And then I realized like, oh, okay, after I crunched a hundred, this is on the low end, that's on the high end. Wow, I didn't realize that higher return deals, people chase those, but then you don't realize that they're, they're usually high return for a reason. That's because like, there's a lot of shit that you got to take on. <laughs> so so you, you go and you do that homework and then ultimately you get to the point where you say, okay, this is going to be the deal. You might not have enough cash to buy it. Maybe you do. If you do, that's great. If you don't, like I didn't, you have to go and raise cash, which means that you know, you got to go and convince people, hey, I, and I did it 10, 20, 25K at a time. Hey, let me get 20K. Let me get 25K. Let me get, you know, and then you enter that new phase, which is like, oh, snap. Um, you really got to know everything about the property because you're going to get asked everything about the property. 
And then, you know, ultimately, it, once you're able to bring on that capital and, and you have the bank give you the loan, which by the way, now here's a really interesting thing. Banks care more about the asset than you, the individual, when you get to the commercial level. Interesting. I, oh, I that's, that, that, could be a, thinking, that could be a good thing. That's a great thing. Yeah. Right? Because I was sitting there thinking like, damn, why is a bank going to loan me like a few million dollars? This is my first right. time doing this. And then I realized that they, because it's commercial and it's based on the income of the property, they're yeah. only looking Less at risk. me secondarily. They're looking at how good is the deal. And then I realized like, oh shit. And then the investors, they care about your operating chops, but they also care about the deal. And so then I realized like everything comes, like all the value is really the deal. So if you find a good deal, you will be able to tie it up. Mm -hmm. um, so, so anyway, look, I know I covered a lot there and you know that you can unpack that over the course of honestly a lifetime. But what I will say is whether you get into that game or whether you get into houses or whatever, guys, remember this, you can't win the game of Monopoly without at least having houses, right? Like it doesn't matter if you have a, the most cash in Monopoly. If you don't have anyone land on your, sh on your squares and pay you rent, you don't win the game. And so I realized like life is kind of a similar way where you're not necessarily trying to win, but you're trying to, develop comforts you're trying to raise your family's vibration you're trying yeah. to afford a good life for your kids and having a stockpile of cash believe it or not doesn't get you there what gets you there is having stock that people land on that pays you that you can grow your family so that's kind of like the crash course on that man um and you know i know it got like it's in the weeds some um but I do the best I can to explain it in a way that gets people to be like, oh, yeah, but also without trying to cop out on like some of the, um, you know, the, some of the tactical stuff. I love it, bro. So much that we can go deeper on. We'll have to we'll have to talk more about that and see how we can continue to serve and this and continue to learn from you, bro. And can't wait to see you. Um, you know, it's interesting because what you're talking about and it's something that I think we all think about, especially us millennials, right, is like financial freedom. And it does, it's not easy to create, but when I think about, when I met with one of my fund managers and he asked me, he's like, Gerard, what's like, what's like the ultimate goal, right? And I was like, well, financial freedom in a sense, right? With my money right. that I've saved up. And he's like, well, what does that mean? And then, and we got into this definition of, guys, I want you to comment. What is your definition of financial freedom? What Great is, question. I'm going to call the first, I'm going to, I'm going to read the, I'll read like the first one or two, but what is your definition of financial freedom? And then we'll take some questions, John, if you're down. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll take two, two or three. That's a great question. Yeah. And then, John, Yo, what is, let me ask you, what is, what is your definition of financial freedom? Sure. So, you know, for me, it's based on when you have invested your capital in income generating assets that are providing you cash flow that actually, without you having to do the, any more work, you have these assets that are producing you enough free cash flow, positive cash flow, that it pays all of your bills and your family's bills without you having to work. That'd be nice, right? man. You know, you know, that's financial <laughs> freedom, right? Yep. So, but there's not many things and assets that can do uh, that are really able to do that. And that's right. why I think real estate is, is obviously so attractive. And, you know, for me, I do believe in diversity right now. I'm, I've, I've always been, since I started my career in stock. So I have, I've been making some moves in the stock market right now, right, I right. Always, you know, make, doing well there. Um, startups, I'm like so iffy with, but I know yeah. that there's, there for me, as you know, I'm really big in psychedelic movement. And there's a second, similar to the cannabis movement, it creates a lot of healing. And there's a lot of opportunity that in capital, that's going to be moved to these conscious companies a lot of conscious capitalism that's happening and i think there's a lot about a lot of growth opportunity for startups um nice. i think e e education you know why i've branded myself for the last five years like i like to turn gerard adams into an asset um leaders yep. create leaders into an asset through my brand that i can one create change and impact and leave that behind for my kids and watch the videos and watch these things that we're doing right now and yep. it inspire others because i measure but i also measure my success and how i can inspire and create success in others and you can turn that into an income generating asset, which I'm doing with LCL. Real nice. estate is the, believe it or not, it's like the number one. When you think about wealth in the world, real estate is like at the top of that list. You know, 
believe it or not, art is too, which is really interesting because I love art. That's that's true. That's that's true. It's like when you look at a lot of like uh, wealthy people's net worth, uh, 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 higher than I would normally think percentage like comes from art, and it just gets me to scratch my head. And I actually yeah. think of you because I know you've been on that way for a while. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, man, I, I love it, bro. And there's so much leverage there, and I can't wait to jam with you more about this. It's something where I want to invest more of my money. Let's see what we got here, though. Let's take some questions, guys. That's my definition. Um, let's see. What, I see what King Victoria. I like what you said, Victoria. You said money working for me rather than me working for money. I love that. That is mm. financial freedom. Great, Great definition. Great response. You got yep. you know uh, the X here says enough money to work on my own terms to pay to work on things that make me happy and pay all my bills. I love how you included happiness um, as part of it. As you heard, John, you know, he, he really does. You know, it sounded like, bro, like you did the thing that as much as it's like the hard work, you get joy. It sounds like you have joy. And I think that's really important. You know, the fact that, you know, create, you know, investing your money into things that also logically make sense and will create wealth for you. But I love the fact that John is talking about how he's changing families' lives. It's not even, even, yes, from a cap standpoint, he has equity in these homes, but he's seeing the impact it's creating in that community. And again, raising yep. that vibration. And I think that's so, so beautiful. So money while you sleep, Bryce said. I like that, bro. I like that. Yeah, man. Absol absolutely, man. Money while you sleep. So I would take some questions here, guys. Um, we got Eric here. Eric Visioner just says, what's an amount to start with to invest more into real estate? So what did you start with, John? I started with 25 grand um, and I raised another like 175 to, to close, to put round up 200 grand. The bank loaned me 500 okay. grand for that first deal. So we bought a $700,000 building. And it's funny because I, you know, I had that, I had a good percentage of that in cash um, and so I could have just done it myself, but I yeah. actually, it's a, in alignment with my vision to, uh, you know, you want to make other people money too, man. You want to make other people. So like, you not know, just that, but like people don't talk about the act, like the, the leverage, like they don't teach us that credit growing up, like credit and leveraging these banks. You know what I mean? Like exactly. they're leveraging our money regardless. Like I got all my money saved to put in the bank. They're, I don't, they don't even have my money. They're lending my money out to other people exactly. making money on my money. So why not us? Why not our community learn the system? Exactly. So like, you know, when you go to the bank, yeah, you know, you like that comfort of like withdrawing the cash, you know, that's why they don't invest in super risky stuff. But yeah, hundred percent, they don't sit on that cash. They invest it, which means when you let your money sit in the bank, you're really just saying, Hey, I don't have the confidence to invest my own money. I want someone else to invest it on my behalf, which if that's you, great. But um, so listen, you can start with a pretty low amount of cash. But look, if you're going to be the brokest partner in the deal, you got to be the smartest partner in the deal, right? Like you can't be broke and then know the least. <laughs> that's not going to fly. You got to know. So like people ask me all the time, hey, because it's tempting to get caught up on the money piece. But before money, you got to have your chops and then you'll see deal like chops you'll be able to find deals and then deals attract the money so um so that's my answer to that question cool you got luke here that says where do you see the commercial real estate industry heading with the change in work culture Ooh, that's a great question man uh who knows what happens to we work um yeah adam newman made out with 1.7 billion dollars in cash i think he's all right but like he's everyone good else <laughs> you know who knows <laughs> I, look guys I, you know i think that right now we're seeing that geography is not as important maybe as we thought and look there's always going to be value to be in the big cities but here's one thing i do assure you is that a lot of pe people looked at their over leveraged personal situations and realizing that they don't need to be paying 75 percent of their income in rent so that they live in a cool spot so they can impress their friends i guarantee you that's changing and you're going to see a lot of net migration of people moving to communities on the outskirts of big cities. That's where I buy. I buy in, you know, bigger towns and small cities outside the, you know, the big cities that we all know, like New York City and Miami and stuff. And I think that that's going to get a big pop. So if you're looking to get yeah. into this, look for those small towns outside big markets. I agree. I agree. What's the best resource? We'll just pop through these. John, what's the best resource to learn for real estate development in your opinion? 
um, experience. Other than, do, other than doing it, right? Experience. Other than doing it, uh, walk, <laughs> walk a lot of real estate. Just pretend yeah. like you got money, like you're going to go buy and walk a lot of property and you'll start getting, you'll start getting it. What's the, well, you do more commercial. What's the smallest unit size that you prefer when buying residential? Um, you know, the bigger, the better for me, but Hey, look, I'm, I have a house under contract right now because my family is kind of scared to get into big deals. So I'm using this as a, as a starter kit tool to get my whole family involved end to end. So you can make money on a house. You can make money on a big deal. You know, just look for something where you have an edge. Got it. Oh, we say we got an inside joke here from uh, Limitless Motivation asking, what's the definition <laughs> of a cap rate? <laughs> I think that's what the title is. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, good. that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good, man. That's good. Oh, uh, that's cool. Um, Next. Let's see. Can you know, uh, let's see. <laughs> Um, is it a good idea to think of a business in a global scale before starting local? Uh, uh, it depends. I think on it the depends business. on the business, right? Yeah, it depends on the business. Like if you're going to, you know, if you're going to start real estate, obviously not, you can't be global, but right. some businesses are just like inherently global. Like, you know, probably your business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got We do have another question here from tech We've been talking about a, a, a cap rate. Is that relative to real estate as well, John? what uh the cat what's it what was that yeah we, well right above tech uh technicary oh, well uh let's say Talk what the, the, what's the definition yeah, of cap rate? yeah uh, yeah the, well so the for those rate, that are actually yeah yeah so i could break down the cap rate a little bit you know because such a basic term um so the cap rate is the the net operating income over the purchase price but it's just fancy talk for saying like hey if I buy a deal all cash, what's my return? Yeah. Now, you almost never buy a deal all cash. But the reason that you think that way is because the financing piece, the debt that you get can vary so much from individual to individual. So it can taint the performance of the property. So you usually want to underwrite a deal to start just based on the cap rate. So you have an understanding of how well that property performs. And just to break that down a little bit more, because that's just the number, but here's, a, the, here's what information it should transmit to you as an investor. The lower the cap rate, meaning the lower the return, typically the more stable the property is, right? Because a low cap rate means, if, since you're getting a low return, that means you're paying more for the property. So low cap rates usually indicate higher purchase price. And so when you see low caps, like in New York, you get a three cap which is the, the equivalent of what a bond, a U.S. bond pays you. So that's right. the stablest it's ever going to get, right? And so when you see like cap rates at like 14%, you know it's in the hood. You know it's got a lot of shit wrong with it. Like, you know, and that's okay. Like investors like myself, we learn how to deal with that hair on that deal. But the cap rate will indicate to you how much risk is involved in that property. And just the last thing I'll say there is when you're starting out, it's okay to pursue higher cap rates because, hey, high risk, high reward, you're starting right. out, you want to build your money up. But as you get rich, like if I had $100 million invested in real estate, I'm not going to go for a 10 cap. And, you know, I'm going to go for something really stable because 3% of $100 million is $3 million a year in income. And that's, you know, perfectly good if you ask me. So, so cap rate indicates risk. It's got so much information in that cap rate. How much risk, how priced the property is and so on so john what are like what are three things to avoid mistakes that you made when you came into real, real estate development that now you would you know mention to people to like really avoid like these are the three mistakes that you made or you see that are common that are out there that people make when they get ready to start investing into real estate it's a great question i think first is man i grow mated um the cost of repairs because I'm just so optimistic. I walked into a building. I knew it was beautiful. It is beautiful. I doubled the value of it. But, but at first I was like, oh, yeah, it's just cosmetic, paints and floors. You know, and like I didn't know. And there's no way to know, to be fair, until you've gone through it a number of times. But I didn't know to look for the right things. So to the extent that you can, please walk property with someone who's got a trained eye. 
You know, I didn't see the windows needed insulation. I didn't see the floor joists were bad in some spots. And, you know, I didn't know about water boilers, about roofs, about stuff like that. So the, the number one, number two, and number three of, for the three tips is learn to estimate costs because you'll find sometimes people are scared of a deal when they shouldn't be because it just looks bad. No worries. You can fix that up, you know. So you might be able to spot yeah. hidden value if you get good at spotting costs. On the flip side, sometimes a deal looks decent because it looks pretty, but some of the more expensive fixes like the plumbing and the electrical is, is all messed up. So learning to look for the most expensive things first is key. The most expensive things is electrical, plumbing, structural, and the roof. Like anything else is not that expensive to fix, I promise. Mm. Paint is cheap, floors are cheap, everything else is cheap. But those three or four things will make or break the deal for you. Did you think about it when you were thinking about making these repairs and getting involved and now you're developing and you're in it, like building a team, just like you were in the startup industry. It's like, how do I find the right team that's reliable and how did you onboard that team and say to yourself, okay, this is the team that I know I can rely on. That's going to give me the best price, the best quality. I'm going to use for all of my development projects. And then how did you think about that and go about that? Yeah. So that's one thing I didn't do that I would mm. do. Like now I have my team. So I got my people, but if I would have done what you said, I think I could have saved myself a lot of headache. Um, so because I wasn't thinking about it in that way, Right. Like when you yeah. come from startup world, like, yeah, you, you know, you think in terms of teams and executing. Yeah. And like, I know that as well as anyone. And then I, for some reason, like I switched lanes and I forgot to take the same basic principles along with me. So definitely, definitely take care to build a team as best you can in the early stages. Cool. So uh, we'll take a couple more here. Um, let's switch it up. Oh, wait. Let's see, let's switch it up for a quick second because you've been in the personal brand game for a little bit. But if you were creating a personal brand or improving a personal brand during this time, what would you focus on, focus on the most right now? And yeah, I mean, like just, just how do you even think about personal branding now, now yeah. that you've gone, gone through this whole, this whole journey? Yeah, that's, uh, that's my boy, Kenny Soto. Kenny Soto's a talented kid, man. Uh, CUNY has some chops in with the Gary team. Moved to China, nice. came back very... Uh, eclectic kid um man thanks for asking kenny yeah 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 uh i love personal brand um and right now i think is a really really great time to get one off the ground um just you know get one and if you have one off the ground then this is the time where you really nurture and go deep and anything that you know applied in 2019 applies now times 10 so you know it's just yeah. you have a completely captive nation you know, everyone's at home consuming on their screens all day. And so, you know, if you're going to be in the personal brand game, you realize like, hey, the more I share and, and offer context around my situation, the more people develop color about your life, a little bit more trust. You know, like I put out these like, you know, consulting sessions and, you know, I sold out within a couple hours. If you don't have a personal brand, you're not going to be able to do that because yeah. you have to push uphill and introduce yourself and, you know, you and I, Gerard, can walk into certain rooms and we don't, we don't, there's no, no introduction required, mm. right? Because we've invested in setting that yeah. content. So all to personal brand is for me is like walking into a room. Sorry, uh, that was my phone. Walking into a room and having people know exactly what I'm about already. So we can skip the small talk and we can just get straight yeah. to like, hey, this is what I care about. And, you know. They'll know I care about it. I know they care about it. And you can get right to building more meaningful connections because the content sets that context up front. I love that. I love that. Naveel, if you're asking, if you're thinking about, if you're talking about the real estate thing, then it went through. Um, I have a video on it. We did a $400 million deal uh, in wow. New York, which, yeah, like, but, um, so that deal closed for me, but it's like really interesting because the partners that are that have developed the commercial the the, uh, the buildings the condos in New York, they're in trouble right now. You know, New York is uh, is an interesting situation in regards to real estate. It's going to be really interesting to kind of see how this plays out over the next five 
10 years where you, you know, people are going to be selling. Can you pick up some stuff? And are you thinking, what are you thinking about New York? You're from New York. You're from Harlem. People yep. are like scramming from there, getting out of there. commercial. When they talked about working in, in those commercial real estate and businesses, they're kind of starting to realize now I don't have to be paying these high rates. So are you thinking about, you've been in Philly, you've been making moves over there or PA, right? Yeah. Yeah. And now, are you thinking about, are you keeping your eye on New York right now in that market and from a real estate perspective, John? No, to buy? No, I'm not. Um, okay. I think, I think people are going to realize, like, I love New York, man. You know, you know how it is. I love the energy. Yeah. Like, I, you know, it's my favorite city in the world. But I just don't think people want to be cooped up in small apartments anymore and overpaying. So I'm not going to be looking at New York for the time being. Now, just because I'm not cool. doesn't mean that there's no opportunity there. You know, right. there's always opportunity, but I'm not going to be looking Cool. Well, John, bro, listen, I, I want you to just, if you can, first and foremost, before we hop off, bro, I honor you. You know, you've you, become, you become a, a dear friend of mine, man. Um, I've loved celebrating you. I will always celebrate you. Um, I think we need to celebrate our community more and more. And there's not a lot of Latino leaders that are out here in the millennial generation. I would like to see more of you. If you're watching this, this is your time to start that brand. This is that time to go all in and serving your community and thinking about how you can serve the whole and just start, just start, you know, like me and John, we started just like you at zero. We didn't have anything <laughs> handed to us. We didn't have no rich yep. parents. We didn't have nothing handed to us. You know, we worked and worked and worked and grinded and we got in our, got uncomfortable. You know, we started sharing our voice, sharing our story, even when we felt wasn't good enough. And little nice. by little, you know, it added up, it added up, it compounded. And then that experience started to compound and that wisdom started to compound. And then the relations started to compound. And now, you know, we have the opportunity to create real wealth and impact economically in the world. So I am, uh, again, if you're listening to this, this is your time. Uh, John, I honor you, bro. I love you, man. Thank I you, appreciate man. the Thank work you, that man. you're doing. I'm always going to celebrate man. you and back you. What's, you know, coming from a leader's perspective, you know, my whole branding around leadership. So it's like, from a leader's perspective, what is one last, you know, piece of advice statement that you want to make right now, knowing where we currently are from an economic standpoint right now, coming out of COVID, what would be something that you would just want to leave behind, you know, for someone that's watching this right now? I love it, man. blowing me up <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, good. i love it man uh hey love is mutual man love and respect is mutual and look my line is what came to heart is exactly what you're talking about is like we came up together man and and like you know the pe peer like the relationship that we have with our peers i think is so underestimated man like people always look up to the next generation but i love this network of peers that we have and so for like people watching now who are going to be the next wave after us, like I would encourage you guys to just look around your network and build with your peers. Cause these are going to be the people that you're going to be, trust me, like, you know, Gerard and I, we, we, maybe we don't link up in person a whole lot, but we see each other a whole lot, right? Mm -hmm. Same events, same awards, same this and that. And so your peers are going to be the people that you're going to be building with the next 10, 20, 30 years. They don't go away. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's my words of encouragement for the next gen, like find comfort in building with your peer base because they're going to be there with you. You know, they understand what it's like in this moment. So take a little bit of emphasis off looking up to us, which we appreciate and we're always here for. Um, and we're here to help, but just as importantly, your peers is, are just as much of a bedrock for you. And you're gonna have develop, you're gonna develop some of the most beautiful friendships, man, that last a long time. And uh, yeah, like you know, like our friendship, and you know, we'll be kicking it ten years, twenty years down barbecue, the road talking about man. this, you know, all this stuff. So it's a beautiful thing, man. And I really wish people cared about that a little yeah, bit more. Bro. Absolutely, man. I mean, shit, we still got a long journey to go, bro. I can't wait till we have yes. family, family one day, and they're and they're. You know, we could sit back, cigar, you know what I'm saying? Cerveza, <laughs> cerve cerveza you know, we relax it. We got, we got that financial freedom, spiritual freedom, lifestyle freedom, and our family is happy and healthy, man. And I sending prayers and love to your family. Thank you for sharing, brother. I'll talk to you later. I'll shoot you a text. This will be repurposed into a podcast, everybody. So subscribe to Leaders, Create Leaders, and uh, 
John, I will send you a folder with it as an asset. Thanks again, bro. I'll talk to you later. Yo, peace. Thanks, guys. I right, guys. Thanks for taking some time to join again. Another powerful, powerful live. If this was powerful for you guys, do me a favor and go and comment. Leave a comment and drop a comment on John's page. Drop a comment on my page. Let me know so that I can look at your profile, like your stuff, and connect with you. Um, also, make sure to subscribe to Leaders Create Leaders on iTunes or Spotify. If you can, screenshot it, tag me on your story. I'll repost you and I'll connect with you. It would mean a lot to me. So thank you for all of you that have subscribed to the podcast, that have left a review. It means a lot. Please share it with your friends. And I'll see you guys on tomorrow's live at 11, 11 a.m. PST. Shout out to all my leaders. Remember, guys, leaders create leaders. Be the leader. Peace.